Justice has been denied for the families of the anti-apartheid activists Ford Kalata, Matthew Guniwe, Sitelo Mflauli and Sparum Konto, known as the Kradok Four, who were killed by the apartheid security branch officers on the 27th of June 1985. This after a key suspect, Hermanus Barant Duplessis, died last month at the age of 79. He was one of the last surviving security branch officers behind the brutal killings of the Craddock Four and was facing a prima facie criminal case for the kidnapping and murder of the Craddock Four. Now, this has raised questions on so many other similar cases and investigations, including the death of activists such as Neil Agat, Noctula, uh, Noctula Sumelani, Iman Abdullah Haron and Ahmed Timur. Earlier this year, the National Prosecuting Authority appointed advocate Dumisa and Sabeza to head a team that will conduct a thorough assessment and make recommendations, if necessary, to strengthen the NPA's handling of TRC cases, with the possibility of the cases being escalated to the National Director of Public Prosecutions. So, to talk more about where we are as the country in terms of apartheid crime prosecutions, we are joined by Dr. Zaid Kimi. He's the Executive Director at the Foundation for Human Rights. Doctor, thank you so much for coming in. And I think a, a very, very important conversation that needs to be held when we talk about something like this again. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, when we, when we think of the, the Craddock Forum, we think of where we're at now, the last remaining witness that may have the solutions and the answers and justice may have been served is now gone. Where does this leave the Craddock for? Um, uh, let us be clear, it may not have been the last witness. Uh, there are other people who had knowledge of what happened, but he was the last person who had, was directly implicated in the killing. Mm -hmm. And with his death, all reasonable likelihood of a prosecution uh, is now uh, finished. Yeah. And so we're left with a situation where the families uh, of the four victims now will not be able to see justice done. No one will ever now be prosecuted for those killings. And this, this is, I mean, because we, we've been following this very, very closely. We've, you know, been speaking so much about the Craddock Four for all of these years and, um, you know, be, being sort of trying to keep the story alive and, and certainly Fort Kalata Sun is a, a key role play in all of this. But th this now is, is the reality, is that now that we've, we've lost um, Hermanus Barn and Duplessis, one can unfortunately reach the conclusion that justice has been denied for these families. Yes, and certainly now, at least for these families, the conversation must turn to understanding why that justice was denied. Um, and we need to now look very carefully at what the political interference was that delayed the prosecution of this case, and what the subsequent actions were that led to an ineffective prosecution. Um, so I think Yes, the, the people directly implicated in the killings, they have escaped justice. And now we must turn to trying to understand why this miscarriage of justice happened. And the people who were complicit, yeah. either by design uh, or by inaction for the state of affairs, must now be called to account. Yeah. I know that um, Lucanio Calata, who is the, the, the son of, of Fort Calata, is they're saying that they now want to go as far as suing the state. Um, they say that they're not going to leave this, this is going to be taken further. But, I mean, if they couldn't get justice in the manner that they tried, which was, which was promised at the TRC, this was something that was, that was meant to happen, this was what was handed down, and yet all these years later, it never happened. I mean, do they stand a chance if they take this as far as now saying, we're going to sue the state? I think this, these TRC cases are sort of an untreated cancer at the root of our democracy. How we are able to move forward, leaving behind cases where it was a clear injustice, we had a political process, a formal process to understand what had happened. We weren't entering into a world where everyone who had committed crimes would simply be pardoned. And in these particular cases, as in many others you mentioned, uh, Nokatula Similani and others, no amnesty was granted. 
and the responsibility was with the NPA to prosecute those cases. Mm, mm. So I think there's, we certainly, the family and uh, the, the teams that support them will not be leaving this issue. Um, it's not the same as having the perpetrators brought to justice, but the subsequent crimes, the subsequent miscarriage of justice. I think we will pursue that. I mean, if we look at when this was this was handed over, um, the, 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 the whole commission, the report was handed over to President Mandela in October 1998. Here we sit in, um, in June of 2023, and we're talking about what one could call a travesty of justice, and the families are still suffering. And through the years, there has been calls, there have been calls for commissions, calls for things to, to, to the, the amount of money that was promised at the TRC, the, the reparations, everything that was handed over in that commission has been challenged and tried and, and tried to get justice. And yet it seems to fail every single time. Why? What, what is the problem, do you believe? I think at the root, there's simply a lack of political will to prosecute these cases. Um, and you know, and that's not simply a, a case of someone's opinion. Uh, there was a Supreme Court judgment uh, in the follow-up to the Ahmed Timol inquest, where the, the Supreme Court found that there had been political interference. We don't understand at this point how that happened, why that happened, but those are questions that have to be answered. Mm. My view is that if you've made one decision at some point in time that we cannot prosecute certain crimes because people believe it's in the national interest or maybe they have a personal interest in it, this is the sort of thing that simply recurs. You've gone there once, we, can't, we don't need to prosecute these things, we can move on. Come the arms deal, we don't need to prosecute, we can move on and I'm sure we'll simply keep repeating this process ad nauseum. Mm. If we are a country based on the rule of law, then the prosecuting authority has an obligation to either prosecute or to give reasons why they will not prosecute and to do so expeditiously. One of the frustrating things with the Craddock 4 case is that the families had to go to court yeah. to force the NPA to make a decision. And that was two, maybe three years ago. And the NPA then gave assurances in front of the portfolio committee. Yes, we are on the verge of making a decision, but what we end up with is no decision. And so justice has been denied, but the families have also been denied alternative remedies. If the NPA had taken the country into its confidence and said, we can't prosecute this case or that case because we don't have the evidence, we don't think we have the evidence, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the money, whatever the reasons may be. At that point, the family would have been entitled to assume, pursue private prosecutions. And this happens over and over again. Yeah. It's not simply that we make the wrong decisions, it's that we don't make any decisions at all. Indeed. And we're in this legal purgatory where cases are under investigation, and we can keep them under investigation until, as in this case, everyone dies. And then we can close the file and move on. The reasons given, and this was, this was, this was given last year already by the, the Justice Minister, Ronald Lamola. He was saying that um, uh, the NPA does not have the investigative capacity to, to do these cases. Um, he admitted this in June, the NPA announced, this was last year, an inquiry to be established into political interference preventing the prosecution of cases stemming from the TRC. Where are we with all of this? I mean, this was, you know, these are the things that, that, that have been promised, saying the NPA doesn't have it. They need an investigative arm to go further into these cases, that they're going to investigate if there's political interference. Where are we at? Has anything happened? We've seen no movement on an investigations into political interference. There was uh, a commission of inquiry appointed advocate uh, in Cerveza, but his brief was specifically to look at the reforms that had been implemented by the NPA with respect to prosecuting TRC cases. His remit was not to go back and understand why we had arrived at this particular point what the mechanism for political interference is. And until we resolve that question, it's, uh, it's an open question. What if it happens again? 
maybe it doesn't happen with uh, the TRC cases, but the next set of cases, what if there's political interference? What mechanisms do we have in place to stop that? Do we simply appeal to people's good nature? We hope that this sort of thing won't happen again. That's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. We need some action on those issues. Indeed, and, and this, is, you know, this is the reality, is that we need, ac uh, we need action on this because we, we keep talking about what's happening with the Craddock 4, but I mean, we don't have to go at, at too far when we have a look at what happened with Ahmed Timur. It, it is the same situation where he was also um, one of the, the country's tragic events now where the main witness, Jean Rodriguez, died after being charged with his murder. Um, again, thrown out. These cases are, we never get the answers. We know that they happened there. We know that atrocities were committed, but nobody's ever held responsible for this. And, and it's just th these cases just keep on going and no answers and yeah. the doors just closed. Yeah. Which I think is, you know, eventually we will run out of time. Yeah. Uh, the prospect at this stage for actual prosecutions are pretty bleak. There are a couple of cases in court Nokatula Similani, the coast has four. But those are also being delayed. Uh, you know, the defense bringing, you know, various delaying tactics into play. So it seems unlikely at this, case, at this stage that we'll ever have a successful prosecution. And at some point our attention must turn to why this happened and how it happened. And that the people responsible are able to account for their actions. Yeah. Um, again, the point is, we don't ask these questions, we'll simply keep repeating this process over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. We won't have rule of law, we'll have rule of law for some and then not for others. And uh, people in power can decide, you know, on a random basis whether or not they apply the rule of law. And we can't have that. No. We need an NPA that takes the country into its confidence and says we can either prosecute or not prosecute and these are the reasons and does so expeditiously. Yeah. Then people are at liberty to move forward with private prosecutions or whatever other means they feel necessary or to challenge the NPA on the basis that the of the reasons that they've given. Uh, this, this is the reality and, and one of the other promises that was made last year, I mean it, we, we hear lots of promises but it's whether, mm -hmm. whether or not there's, there's anything that comes from that is that um, uh, Minister Lamola also said that the NPA has taken steps to improve communication processes with the victims' families. Do, do you, are you in touch with the victims' families? Has this happened? Do you know if they feel that there is more communication coming and that they can actually move forward on whether or not MPA can do it or not, or they must go ahead and do private prosecutions? I said, I am aware that there has been far more effective communication with victims' families, and that's great. But communication is one thing. Action is another. Yeah. Do we see any tangible results from this communication? We, you know, to be fair, we have a system where I think the, the NPA can blame the police, the DCPI, for the quality of the investigation. The DCPI can turn around and blame the NPA for the quality of the prosecution. Everyone has someone else to blame. Yeah. What I think we as the Foundation for Human Rights, and I'm sure the families would like to see, is someone take responsibility. The NPA had made a commitment to the families. That commitment was not held. And we have silence. Some acknowledgement, some form of humility, some embarrassment at what has happened, that would be great. That wouldn't resolve the issue, but it at least show that this is in people's minds. It's just not another thing, yeah. you know, that passes silently. And this is the thing, I mean, these are the words, and I'm going to quote what um, Lucanio Calata had said. This was a year ago when all of these promises were made um, with regard to, you know, finalizing these apartheid cases. He was saying, the NPA is not an innocent bystander in the investigative process. It can and should play a very active role in fast-tracking these long-standing, outstanding matters. The fact that it's not happening is a terrible indictment on the state. In fact, it says a lot about what the powers that be think of the people who laid down their lives for the constitutional freedoms that we all enjoy today. I think those are very scathing, but 
unfortunately, what we're seeing, true words that were uttered by Lucanio Calata, that mm -hmm. is the son of the late Fort Calata, yeah. with regard to these. Do, do you think that this is pretty much so summing up what's going on? Yes. Unfortunately, that is the case. You know, this is not just another murder case. Everyone was well aware that we were up against serious time constraints and that we had to move fast. So within that context, it's simply not excusable to continue to delay and prevaricate. You know, uh, make a decision, move along and be frank and honest about what you're doing. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think we as a country expect of a prosecuting authority, nothing less. Yeah. Their job is to prosecute crimes and they must prosecute all of them or make decisions about what not to do. But again, as you know, we're in this, this world, this purgatory where we wait and investigations are in process and things are happening. But when the rubber meets the road, this is the result we get. And you know, at some point, people's patience will run out. And, and that's the issue. Just, just finally, as, as I wrap this up, of, of the 300 finalized cases that the TRC report handed over to the NPA, uh, which involved gross violations of human rights, how many have been prosecuted or concluded at this stage? None. No. And, um, yeah. do we know which cases are being investigated? Do we know what the progress is with individual cases? It's not a matter of asking for the details. It's simply asking, do we know what's happening? Does the public that has a right to know, know what's happening with those, each of those cases? Has there been a decision not to prosecute? Have all of the witnesses died? We know about this case because we, we support the family members. Mm. We're intimately involved in the case. So we know that now there's no reasonable prospect of a prosecution. What's the situation with these other cases? Is, has there been a statement saying we started with 300, we're now left with 27 because the others are no longer, um, you know, we can no longer proceed with them. Yeah. So, again, this is not something that's shrouded in mystery. It is not a state secret. There's no reason for the NPA not to communicate with the people of South Africa about what they're doing. Well, we will continue talking about this and we certainly do hope that the NPA can come and talk to us and update the nation as to where they are with all of these cases and the promises that have been made that justice will be given to the victims and the families' victims and where we at with regard to this all these years later. Um, talking to us was Dr. Zaid Kimi, Executive Director at the Foundation for Human Rights, talking to us about the death of the key suspect in the murder of anti-apartheid activists Ford Kalata, Matthew Guniwe, Zitelo Mihlauli and Sparam Konte, known as the Craddock Four, and where we are as a country in terms of apartheid crime prosecutions.